Hi friends, it's Professor Trent. Welcome to REL 110 Chapter 4 Lecture Summary on Hinduism. All right, so first and foremost, I'm going to let you know that this is a chapter for which I have a huge bias because I have studied Hinduism in depth. I've spent time researching in India, and my first book in the academic study of religion is on Hinduism. So I will use your textbook, but a lot of this I'm just going to free flow with the lecture summary. I'll use the framework to guide you through the three questions, but if it seems like this is a really energized and robust and long lecture, it's because this is my actual academic area of study. All right, so, but let's open up your books. We are on page 91, 92, if you've got the third edition. Not too far off if you have the second edition. So first and foremost, let me just preface this by saying we are getting into what's called the global world religions, global world religions. Hinduism is the oldest of what we call the big five among academic religion scholars. And the big five are Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All right, let me do it again. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Now, that is not the chronological order. All right, what I did was I, get, I categorized them into what's called Dharmic traditions, traditions that utilize the word Dharma, which you'll know in just a minute, and Abrahamic traditions. So traditions that come out of the Abrahamic tradition. You all may have remembered the song if you attended Sunday school, Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had da 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 da, you know the song. So Abrahamic means coming forth out of Abraham or you would also know it as monotheism. So we've got Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Dharmic traditions, Abrahamic traditions, I'm talking quickly through this, but you can always go back and listen again. Here's the chronological order. So the order in which they were born, if you will. It goes Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam. That's the chronological order. Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam. Islam is what we call the baby sister of the big five. Hinduism would be the oldest sister of the big five. So we're getting into global world religions at this point, which means that your three questions, your three questions, three categories, academic framework, you can really start to apply that when we get to these global world religions because there is a very organized system of beliefs and practices that should sound very familiar from your definition of religion in chapter one. When we get to these global traditions, things become a little more organized. There's an actual system of beliefs. There's what you might call a box of religion, parameters around the religion, and most of that derives from sacred texts. You know them as narratives in the indigenous traditions. Narratives always start as stories, an oral tradition of storytelling in the community. Eventually, they get written down. So when narratives are written down, they become sacred texts, or you know it in the West as sacred scripture. So Hinduism is the first to start having texts written down in terms of a, a religion that is practiced on a global level, meaning it's practiced everywhere in the world. The first two traditions that you studied were indigenous traditions unique to a specific place and people. North American indigenous traditions, African indigenous traditions, two separate continents. Hinduism starts in, in India, it starts on the peninsula of India, but it spreads all over the globe. And all five of these traditions do the same thing. All right, so page 92, I gave you a little, little backdrop of that. So Hinduism begins circa, circa is just a fancy academic word for around 2000 BCE, BCE. If you don't already know these initials, write them down, BCE. BCE stands for Before the Common Era. CE stands for Common Era. The divider between the two is the year zero. 
All right, so we are 2,000 years before the zero in the Indus River Valley civilization. We're on page 92. So this starts the, the era of Vedic texts, all right, or the Vedas, V-E-D-A-S. And the Vedic narratives, which become sacred texts, are bigger and could fill rooms and rooms and rooms and campuses of colleges with all the sacred texts. Much different than what we see in the Abrahamic traditions where we have um, the Hebrew sacred texts. We've got the Greek New Testament. We have the Quran, one book, right, for each. This is very different. The Vedas are volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of scripture. In other words, friends, in Hinduism, we are dealing with way more content than what you are seeing in the Abrahamic faiths. And because it's the oldest, obviously there's more to work with, which is why chapter four is your heaviest lift in the whole book. It's the most complex chapter and it has the most vocabulary. So let's break it down. All right. Ultimate reality, write this down. Ultimate reality means where do we come from? What is our origin? What or who is our source? In Hinduism, to make it really simple, there are two schools of thought on this, all right? One is called monism and one is called dualism. Monism, you have seen and heard and read as Brahman. Brahman. I'm going to overemphasize that ending. M A N, Brahman. That is monism. Dualism is the idea that the ultimate reality is separate from humanity. Let me say this a little in a different way. In other words, there are humans and there is God, and God is personified in a certain way, character, shape, form, or mood. You've seen this in my PowerPoint as polymorphic monotheism. So let me back up and say that one more time. Monism is Brahman, the supreme unitary reality. Mono, one, one substance. That means that everything is Brahman. Professor Trent is Brahman. The table is Brahman. You are Brahman. Divine reality is Brahman. Everything is Brahman in monism. Dualism says that there are duo, two substances. There is the human and there is the divine or the human and God. And God shows up in many different ways known as polymorphic monotheism. Now, the majority of Hinduism's of Hindu practitioners practice dualism, but occasionally you will meet a Hindu practitioner who practices both, all right? So the caveat there is that Hinduism is very, very flexible and very inclusive. Um, an individual's belief system about ultimate reality, way of life, and ultimate purpose is very flexible. Yes, there are parameters within the religion. It is a unified system of beliefs and practices, but there is much flexibility within that box. So, but the majority of Hindus that you meet, especially here in the Triangle, if you've ever been to a Hindu temple, you're going to see specific depictions of God known as deities. They have characteristics, moods, and they are personified, which means that is dualism. There's God and there is humanity, two different substances, all right? So that's what we mean when we say Brahman. Ultimate reality, therefore, is derived from Brahman, monism, or dualism, God in a mood, a character personified. So the three major moods or characters of God are what we call the Trimurti. So that is Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. Brahma. There's another word that sounds very similar to Brahman. Brahma is the creator. Vishnu is the maintainer. And Shiva is the destroyer. So three different aspects of God. One God, three different aspects. Many, many different aspects. And you, as you dig deeper and deeper, you can learn about the various aspects. But many scholars call this polymorphic monotheism, which means that God takes many different shapes, but it's all God. God with a capital G personified. 
So that is the ultimate reality, way of life. So now that we know where we come from, our origin, what do we do in light of that? And the answer in, in Hinduism is lots and lots and lots of rituals. The narratives, the sacred texts, the Vedas, the Upanishads, they all outline the various rituals that Hindus practice in order to um, ultimately main, uh, attain the ultimate purpose, moksha, which we're going to get to in a minute. So way of life is comprised of three margs. It looks like marga in your book, all right? A marg is simply a way of life, and there's three of them. Bhakti marg, karma marg, and gyan marg. Bhakti marg is the way of devotion or worship. Karma marg is the way of action or service. Gyan marg is the way of meditation, knowledge, intellectualism. Now, Hindus may choose to partake in a way of life that uh, covers multiple margs. One not needs stay on one marg one's entire lifetime, but most Hindu practitioners have a particular marg that they are on in their faith journey. Now, notice I said lifetime. That brings us to a really important aspect that sort of joins ultimate reality and way of life. All Hindu practitioners um, are familiar with various vocabulary that you're reading about in the book, but one of them that I want you to put a star by is samsara. All Hindu practitioners, whether they are monists or dualists, believe in samsara. Samsara, you know it in the West as reincarnation, which means that one is reborn into a new life. We die as humans and we are reborn again into the next life over and over and over for millions and millions and millions of life cycles. That, my friends, is the cycle of life, death, and rebirth known as samsara. So whether you are a monist or a dualist, you believe in samsara, and you believe that what perpetuates your cycle in terms of what life you will have next is called karma. Karma, you know it in the West as instant karma or something that happens immediately. If someone's mean to you, then they trip, you say, ooh, instant karma. In Hinduism, it's very different. Karma is the cause and effect over many, many, many different lifetimes, and it's all about you. What are you doing right now that's going to affect your next lifetime, and what did you do in a previous lifetime that is now affecting your life right now? So I'm gonna pause here for a second and say that Hinduism does an excellent job of explaining the why of human suffering. Because of its complex system of karma and samsara, there's a theology surrounding the cause and effect of one's personal responsibilities and actions in a previous lifetime and a community's actions that affect life now. But here's the good news. You can choose how you react to a certain situation now, which will affect your next lifetime. So it's all a cycle that can be improved over and over and over. We're not going to get too much into the caste system because the John Green video does a great job of explaining the caste system. So I want you to go back and look at that crash course for a deeper explanation of the role that karma plays in the caste system and samsara. Again, go back to the crash course video for more information on that. So way of life. Various rituals are performed by Hindus based on the marg. Bhakti Marg, Karma Marg, Gyan Marg. Bhakti Marg is going to include lots of worship towards a personal deity, let's just say Vishnu, wherein you're going to the temple, you are taking what's called darshan, which is a form of worship in which you are seeing the deity and the deity is seeing you. You're offering food and flowers and water and things that are meaningful to you and most importantly, your time. 
So the bhakti mark is about time, worship, and devotion. For those of you who practice Abrahamic faiths, in other words, for those of you who are Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, you are on effectively a bhakti marg, a devotional worship marg, wherein your attention is directed towards God, a particular form of God in Abrahamic faiths, a monotheistic God, a oneness of God. So in Bhakti Mark, it's all about worship and rituals. You've seen the vocab words puja and arati. All right, so go back and review those if you don't remember those two words. Karma Mark is service. What are you doing for your local temple, your local community? How are your actions? Are they in line with what is good and just? Are they in line with ignorance? Are they in line with passion? And calibrating your actions and service to be the best person you can be in this life so that you will get a good, a better life next go round. Gyan Marg is all about study, intellectual study, pursuit, reading the sacred texts, and meditation. You're gonna see this in the monastic community if you've ever, if you don't know what a monastic community is, that's a monk, right? Or a sadhu, as you saw it in your book. A lot of monists, going back to ultimate reality, are on Gyan Marg. In other words, they will utilize the rituals and practices of meditation, scripture study, gaining knowledge in order to achieve their ultimate purpose, which is merging back into Brahman. We'll talk about that when we get to ultimate purpose in just a moment. Before we head to ultimate purpose, there's so much that you can read about way of life. I want you to really dig in here because it's really fascinating. Their Dharma is a part of way of life. So um, in the margs, are you living your best duty in all of the margs, depending on what your dharma is for this particular lifetime? Again, John Green does a great job explaining dharma and the caste system. Now let's talk about once you have your ultimate reality, you have your way of life, then we have a goal that we're trying to achieve in Hinduism. And the goal is ultimate purpose. And this um, religion the ultimate purpose is moksha. Write that down, moksha. Moksha is liberation. Will you say liberation from what? Liberation from samsara, that endless cycle of life, death, rebirth. And you might say, well, why would you wanna be liberated from life? Why wouldn't you wanna come back? It's kinda nice here, I, you like your family, you like being on earth. Well, in Hinduism, think about it. The more times you take on a body, a physical body, the more you might be likely to, um, I'll just use a Western term, regress back into a behavior or a pattern or a situation that may not bode well for your next lifetime. In other words, you're trying to eliminate bad karma so that you can get to net zero and attain liberation. All right, you're gonna hear more about this from our guest practitioner, Gauravani Das. We're recording a podcast with him this week. He usually comes into the classroom, but he's gonna come in and explain a little bit more about ultimate reality, way of life, and ultimate purpose to give you an insider's view on what this looks like as a practitioner. But going back to moksha, so let's say in this lifetime, I have done everything that I need to do in order to attain moksha. There's no way of knowing that, by the way, if we're actually gonna get liberation, but let's just say for a hypothetical purpose, um, I ha am going to attain moksha. Well, the question is, where do I go? What is the ultimate purpose once I am no longer reincarnated into a human or an animal or a plant body? That's a great question. If you are a monist, and your ultimate reality is Brahman. You return to Brahman, that one unitary, supreme, divine substance. 
your Atma, your soul merges back into Brahman and you become Brahman again. If you are a dualist duo, there's you, the human soul, Atma, and there's God. You will go to be with God in the type of heaven that your personal, your Ishta Devata, that you have chosen for yourself wherever that heaven exists. If it's Vishnu and you are a Vishnu worshiper in dualism, you will go to be in the, the land of heaven with Vishnu. There's many different heavens. And depending upon the type of Hindu you are, you will achieve that afterlife with Vishnu in that eternal realm. Hopeful not to come back into a human body, at least not anytime soon. So that is the ultimate purpose in Hinduism. So we're doing great. We're right at 20 minutes. I'm going to pause there and guide you to the conclusion and the glossary. Again, there's tons of vocab words here. Obviously, you can tell that I'm very excited about this chapter. It's one of my favorites. The conclusion, they do a really good job of explaining the three framework, ultimate reality, way of life, ultimate purpose. In vocabulary words, let me highlight a few for you. Arati, Atma, you heard me say Atma. Atma, but in your book it's Atman with an N. Um, Bhakti Marg, you heard me say Brahman, you heard me say Brahmin, not to be confused with Brahman or Brahma. Brahmin is the highest caste known as the priestly caste. And the easy way to remember this is that a Brahmin is a priest, a minister, M-I-N. So that's a way to distinguish it from Brahman and Brahma. All right, let's see. Darshan, you heard me talk about. Dharma. Gyan Mark, it looks like Janana. It's J-N, that word. Karma, you know what karma is now. Karma Marg. Moksha you heard about. Puja is worship, samsara. Let's see. Uh, what else do I want you to know in here? There are words pertaining to um, those who worship Vishnu, Shiva, so Vaishna, Vaishnav, and Shaivite is in here in your S and V. Vedas, you heard me refer to that. The entire canon of knowledge, Sanskrit knowledge and sacred texts, all Vedic literature, all of those narratives that are written down. Yoga is a term that you're familiar with in Western culture. In Hinduism, we're not talking about the yoga postures. We're talking about yoga as an entire lifestyle. Um, there, there's actually eight limbs of yoga, so it's far more than what you get at your local group exercise studio. And we can talk more about that. That would also be a great final project for those who are, of you who are interested in digging more into what is actual yoga within Hinduism. So I've given you a lot to chew on. Um, we can do more in office hours in terms of answering your questions, but I really want you to concentrate on page 140 where ultimate reality, how should we live, and ultimate purpose is broken down for you in paragraphs. That will also help you synthesize the information that I just shared on our chapter four lecture summary. All right, friends, great job. This is a tough chapter. I'm so proud of you. I'm here if you have any questions. Be sure to look at all the materials within module four, and I'll see you again soon for chapter five. Take care, everybody.